Good afternoon. My name is Jeff DeLisi, and I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer here at Virginia Hospital Center. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us here this afternoon. I'm really honored to be joined by a couple of my colleagues on the medical staff here at Virginia Hospital Center. To my left is Dr. Mary Margaret Lewis, who's the Medical Director of the Intensive Care Unit at Virginia Hospital Center. Dr. Rohit Modak, Medical Director of Infection Prevention. And Dr. Jennifer Permeggi, another one of our infectious disease physicians. I think one of the things that has really made this a successful response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic is that we are a community independent hospital. We've been able to be nimble. We've been able to make decisions quickly, act on things happening, and take great care of our patients. And we've seen some great results because of that. Just a couple highlights of the last few months here. We were the first area hospital to stand up a drive-through testing center in Northern Virginia, now, not just Northern Virginia, the DC area. And we've tested over 5,000 patients through that drive-through center now. We knew it was important to get that implemented because we couldn't have all those patients necessarily coming to our ER, coming into our outpatient lab. We wanted a safe, convenient way to test the patients, and we were able to stand that up in just about a week. Second, we were able to use, again, our independent status to make some really quick decisions and get ourselves enrolled in some major trials very quickly. We were just one of 180 sites globally to be part of the remdesivir trial with Gilead. I'm sure a lot of you have seen in the news some of the exciting results that we've seen from that. Patients who get remdesivir were shown to be able to get out of the hospital a little bit more quickly. We were one of the sites that helped prove that, and we're really honored and excited to be part of that. In addition, we've been one of the sites participating in the Mayo Clinic's convalescent plasma trial. What this means is they take uh, blood from patients who have evidence that they were infected by COVID and have antibodies to it. We get that blood, they take some plasma from it, and then we infuse it to patients that have uh, COVID-19. We've actually administered it to already over 60 patients. We're really excited about that. Third, we were one of the first hospitals in the area to get the Abbott Rapid ID test. And what we've done with this is been able to implement rapid testing for lots of patients coming through our hospital. Anybody admitted and anybody having any kind of procedure, whether that's a surgery, an endoscopy, a colonoscopy, a cardiac catheterization, a bronchoscopy, or an interventional radiology procedure, all of those patients are tested on the day of their procedure. And this is really important for a couple reasons. First, if you're going to have a surgery, if you have COVID, and we can find that out, as long as that surgery is not really emergent, we can safely delay the surgery. And what nobody wants is to have to recover from a surgery at the same time they're getting symptoms from COVID. So we think it's so important. And we're seeing about 2% of our population actually testing positive for that. So we're able to very safely do procedures for our patients and for our staff. And we're really excited about that. The end product of all of this has been some really great results. And I'm excited to talk to my colleagues here a little bit more about it this afternoon. One, one statistic that we're really excited about is although we've been taking care of up to 110 patients with COVID in our hospital on any given day, we've only had six staff members infected with COVID out of over 3,000 people. That's an infection rate of 0.2%. We're really proud of that. Secondly, when we look at our mortality rate, the number of patients that have passed who had COVID in our hospital, we've had over about 700 admissions our mortality rate looks to be about 10% lower than the national average. Nationally, it's 22, 23%. We're at 13%. And that means that these doctors right here have helped save the lives of over 50 or 60 people, additional lives, people who might not, patients who might not be alive today if they weren't treated here at Virginia Hospital Center. So we're really excited about that, and I'm excited to have my colleagues here to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that we've been doing over the last couple months to get those great results. So maybe I'll start with Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the changes in care that we've been able to implement here at VHC over the last couple months? And I'm thinking about some of the different things we do in terms of oxygenating patients versus what we used to do for patients that didn't have COVID. Yeah, so we've, we've implemented a lot of different things um, since since the time of COVID. Um, one of, And we've demonstrated amazing 
teamwork. I've been so impressed with the teamwork between the nurses, the respiratory therapists, physical and occupational therapists, and physicians. And then also within different physician groups. We work very, very closely with our ID, our infectious disease colleagues. And, um, and then with our other colleagues, the anesthesiologists, the interventional radiologists, the um, emergency department physicians. So one of the things that we did right at the beginning was we established some specific types of teams to help us out with these patients. And um, an airway team was established with the anesthesiologists so that any time a patient was having diff too much difficulty breathing and needed to be on a ventilator, the anesthesiologist would immediately come and provide that um, that procedure for us, and that helped because it was all it was all um, systematically put put in place um, and very safe, and um, being done by the most experienced operators in the hospital. Um, another thing that we did was we put a line team in place, and so the interventional radiologists immediately helped out with these patients that are so sick and on the ventilators, able to they've. They've stepped up and will place the, the lines, the large catheters that are needed to deliver these medications to the patients, um, and they're doing that very quickly for us. Um, the, these, the patients uh, that go on ventilators are very, very ill, and um, it often takes a long time to recover from COVID. Um, one of the things that we are doing um, is called proning the patient. So it's very simple. Most of the time, people are laying in a hospital bed, sort of sitting up in their hospital bed. But now um, we're very frequently kind of making, have, rolling them over and having them lay on their stomachs. And that helps um, provide better oxygen for the patients. And they end up doing much, much better if they can spend the majority of the day on their stomachs as opposed to their backs. Dr. Lewis, how many hours a day are we uh, asking patients to lay on their bellies? Um, 16 hours a day, about 16 to 20 hours a day, actually. Um, so, and, um, it, you know, and we've worked out different ways to keep people that are on the ventilator and aren't able to move themselves to help them safely move and then help them stay safe when they're laying on their stomachs because it, there are different pressure points um, for people. Oh, that's great. Do Dr. Modak, I think the, the first question I wanted to ask of, of you, and, and we really, Dr. Modak was at the uh, center of getting us involved in the Gilead Remdesivir trial. He spent countless hours uh, getting us enrolled, filling out the paperwork. It's its complicated getting into one of these clinical trials. And, you know, I, one of the things I like to say is when you think of Virginia Hospital Center, you don't necessarily think of us of being in large global trials with such huge impact. But here we were, one of the one of the 180 sites. So can you tell everybody a little bit about your experience of being in the trial, uh, what you thought about going through the process, and, and maybe just a little bit of insight into what, what you've seen with some of the patients getting remdesivir? Thank you, Jeff. So we started this trial about six weeks ago. The process started really almost three months ago. And the idea of a clinical trial is very exciting. I think patients have this idea, and it's accurate to a certain extent, that these are for diseases that we don't have a good answer for, that it's something that you know maybe they can get enrolled in, maybe it can help save their life. And that's the goal, right? The goal is to save people's lives, that we are giving them a medicine that will help. But when we do a clinical trial, it's not that clear. It's not that everyone who comes in just gets it and we hope for the best. We have to do this very scientifically, and I think that was one of the biggest challenges going into this trial, that even as we were telling our medical staff and telling our patients and our employees that we have this great new drug, we don't know if it's great, we're testing it to see, it's not for everybody, that people have to meet certain criteria. That was a big challenge, that people came in very sick. Sometimes they were too sick for the drug, even though those are the people that we suffered with the most, that we knew were not going to do well. So one challenge was finding the right patient for it. And we had our criteria, and we had to stick to it. So that was a big challenge. I think one great thing about Virginia Hospital Center and us doing this trial is that we are a close-knit community, is that we could talk to each other and we trust each other, that we know our ICU very well. It's not, you know, it's not 100 beds. It's manageable, and I say that not that their job is easy by any means, but we have relationships. And this goes throughout the entire hospital. It's with the entire medical staff. It's with our employees. 
that we can talk to each other and we know what these challenges are. So in the setting of a trial, it's nurses coming up to me and saying, hey, I think I have a patient who would qualify. This is a good candidate for your trial. And we talk about it. And sure enough, many of them were and many of them weren't, but that's okay. That was really a community effort. And I found that to be so rewarding that everyone was behind this, that everyone was excited about it. I got more questions about this trial from general staff members you know, over the last three months than any other topic. This is what was on people's minds. So we ended up treating a number of patients. Um, I really can't say the results yet. Number one, uh, Gilead does not want that release until they release it. Number two, we really don't know. When we do these kind of trials, they're taking hundreds of patients across many different hospitals. So our experience may not be what the total experience is, so I don't want to speak out of turn. Um, but certainly, anytime we can provide a potential service, especially for a disease like this, it's something completely unexpected. It's one-third of our hospital at any given time could have it could be filled with COVID patients, and we know there's a certain mortality that, as you mentioned, 13% of people won't make it, and that's tragic. And if there's anything we can do to offer them any little extra hope, I think it's well worth it. And I'm so happy that we were able to participate. Thanks, Dr. Modak. You know, uh, I'm going to turn to Dr. Permegia next. I think um, I wouldn't ask all three of them this question. I, I do have all their cell phone numbers, and they've been on speed dial for me for the last three months, and they've received countless phone calls uh, from, from me over the, over the course of this pandemic. And Dr. Permegia, can you talk to, talk to us a little bit about the progression that happened. I mean, I, I was just thinking back here as, you know, we're, we're all sitting here and reflecting on the last couple months to one of those first weekends of this pandemic hit. And remember, I'm remembering getting texts from you about every patient that might have COVID coming into the emergency room. And then just a short couple weeks later, we had 60, 70, 80 patients admitted with definitive COVID. Talk to us about that. I mean, all three of you have been truly the leaders of our medical staff in treating these patients. Just talk to us a little bit about that progression that happened. Sure. Thank you, Dr. DeLisi. I think for, for us, it was always a when, not if. I remember we all got together and regrouped right after the um, New Year's break, and we said, you know, what about that coronavirus, that respiratory virus in China? Do we have a plan yet? We are going to see this. And we followed the media coverage. We followed what was being reported out of China. And again, we were already reading and preparing. We said, we will see this. It's just a question of when. Um, and, you know, one of the first rules of pandemics is by the time you realize you have a problem, it's too late. Um, I think one of the first cases in the United States was reported in January, but we're already hearing of people who've had positive serology and were ill before the new year. So we already had a problem. So we knew the situation would snowball pretty rapidly. Um, I saw... I want to say it was early January, um, maybe mid-January, a couple students who had come back from Wuhan um, who had been studying and were able to get some of the last flights out to return uh, to college here. And so that was a good trial run for the PPE and uh, for the personal protective equipment to make sure we had supplies on hand and our processes. And after that, it, it really snowballed rapidly. I would say the first wave that we saw uh, involved a number of patients with symptoms, but at that point, uh, the health department uh, was set the rules for testing, and so we told most of these patients, go home, uh, we can't test you, you probably have this, quarantine, uh, self-isolate, um, and come back if you feel more ill. And, you know, learning about the virus and how it progressed, we knew that a lot of patients got better, but some patients would continue to progress over about seven to 10 days, and a number of those patients came back. And I recall, I was on call the weekend in mid-March, and um, it, we had an exponential increase in just a few days. I remember walking into the ICU that weekend, and it was full. The ICU was full. And luckily, we were prepared. We had been preparing for months, so we were prepared. Well, thanks. Thanks for... Uh all of your leadership in getting us prepared. You know, Dr. Promegia mentioned the testing and, and how those first weeks we had to rely on the state to do the testing. We've now crossed at Virginia Hospital Center. I mentioned the 5,000 patients through the drive-through, but we've also tested an additional 5,000 patients in our hospital. So we have tested now over 10,000 patients for COVID uh, here at Virginia Hospital Center. 
Dr. Modak, ne next question for you. Um, one of the things that has been so invaluable with, with your leadership, we have had twice daily, we had twice daily calls uh, with, with kind of the leadership of the hospital for about six or seven weeks. We've only recently uh, kind of taken that back to once a day, but we still have once a day calls. Dr. Modak's been on every single call and his input has been absolutely invaluable. One of the things I, I talked about was our, our very low staff infection rate. And I think that goes to our management of the personal protective equipment or PPE that you've heard so much about in the news. N95 masks, gowns, gloves, uh, and our purchasing team has done a spectacular job, I think, in getting those supplies to keep our staff uh, safe. But Dr. Murdoch, can you talk us through a little bit about the PPE policies that we've put in place? And then I think also, so we've got uh, you know a big group that's listening to this panel. What are the most important things that people can do out in the community to keep themselves safe? Because I think that's really important. I mean, they see all of us wearing masks. What's important for them to continue to do to keep themselves safe? That's a great question, Jeff. So like the testing, like our approach to this virus, to these patients, our approach to personal protective equipment, PPE, has evolved over the last three months as well. In the beginning, it was very scary. We couldn't test people. We saw there were shortages of personal protective equipment across the country. We had a supply. We didn't know if we were going to get any more. It was very daunting. And our staff was scared. And besides worrying about these patients, I'll tell you, I know all of us were very worried about our staff, and, and that kept us kept me awake at night. I know it kept all of you guys awake at night as well. How can we protect our staff? When we had outbreaks before, when we had Ebola in 2015, we only had one potential patient that turned out not even to have it in our hospital. When we had um, H1N1 or swine flu in 2009, you know, we never had issues about protecting our staff. We felt confident. We had enough PPE, we thought we could do it. All of a sudden, this was a new era. You, we were seeing what was happening in New York City on the media, on the news, that people were running out of PPE, that healthcare workers were getting infected. Everyone in our hospital was asking, and appropriately so, why can't we wear N95 masks everywhere? Why can't we have full PPE covering head to toe to protect ourselves? And the answer was, we didn't know if that was necessary. And we would be using a lot of PPE, and we didn't know if we would get any more. So it may protect us for the first week or two, but what happens after that? One thing that we did well, I think, was realize that this is not a two-week problem. This is not something that's going to come hit us and go away. That we are going to be dealing with COVID for the weeks and the months and potentially over a year to come. And we need to be very judicious with our PPE. So when that happens, we look to the science. And I again, I applaud our administration and our hospital and the medical staff and employees for understanding this. And I don't think this happens at a lot of hospitals. If you saw what was happening in the beginning of March, a lot of hospitals were willy-nilly using PPE. If someone had a random idea, they would just do it and then change policies in two days and change policies in two days. And it, it didn't instill any confidence in any of the staff. So I think what we were able to do is really look at the signs. How is this disease transmitted? And like all respiratory viruses, one, two, and three are hands, hands, hands. We have to be good with hand hygiene. Number two, it's respiratory. We have to protect ourselves with masks. Was it appropriate to mask all employees? And initially, it wasn't. We didn't know if we had supplies. It also wasn't as prevalent in our community. We were seeing numbers go up, but we weren't there yet. Eventually, we did get to that point where we said, yes, let's mask all employees. Eventually, we got to the point where we said, let's mask all patients. There was certainly an evolution. I think the important part is to explain what we did well was explain to our staff why we were doing certain things. And like you mentioned in the beginning, I think it's very important we remain nimble. That if there was a suggestion from anyone, how can we make this safer, we did it. And we're still looking at that. Uh, Dr. DeLisi brought up a policy at Mayo Clinic, something that they do to help protect their staff, and we're looking into it. We may adopt that in the next couple of days. We never say, okay, we're doing a great job. Our staff is not getting infected. That's that. We're always looking to improve. How can we make it safer? What's coming? What can we do to keep it safe and keep everyone feeling safe? Not just staying safe, but feeling safe. And it's very important. And part of that is early testing, is being available to everyone, explaining to people. You asked a very good um, second question. How can the general population stay safe? And I think this comes back to what we were saying. How did we protect our employees? So we did that a couple of ways. 
Number one, as I mentioned, hand hygiene. So generally, washing your hands. That's, that cannot be stressed enough. That's how people are going to stay safe. Number two, mask. We mask in the hospital. We need to mask at home. We need to mask when we're within six feet of people. That is going to protect us. It's going to protect them. It's going to protect us if everyone wears a mask. That's not negotiable. Number three, social distancing. It's important to stay six feet away. It's not okay to say, well, I'll just pick a couple of families and be close to them, and it's okay, because those families are picking a couple of families, and very soon it's spreading throughout everyone. Maintain six feet distance. And finally, I mean, it's not something that we can really, or the population can do themselves, but I think testing is very important, that we need to test everyone we can um, if they have symptoms, because if you can identify someone with symptoms early, we can isolate that person and they won't spread it. And that has to be our culture. That has to really be in our DNA, in our society. If we say, yes, we are going to protect my fellow colleagues, my other citizens, that's going to be huge in terms of protecting all of us and really limiting the spread of this virus. Thanks, Dr. Modak. You know, one other thing I want to mention about my colleagues here is one of the things that has just so impressed and uh, humbled me is the, these three not only work tirelessly all day long, but when they go home at night, that's when they're spending time looking at the literature, reading what's out there, looking at their specialty society message boards to find out what other people are doing. I can't tell you the number of times I heard on the phone during one of these calls. Well, I was reading, you know, last night and I found out this and I think we should do uh, this differently. And uh, it's just a real credit to all three of you of how hard you've worked to stay up with what was going on. And I know I'm thankful. I know our patients, our community are thankful as well for, for all the work that you've done. Dr. Lewis, next question for you. I think another thing that is, that's out there right now in the community that people wonder is, is it safe to come to the hospital? I don't think I have COVID, but you know, maybe I'm having chest pain. Should I come? Should I not come? But I know you could probably comment on that because you see the sickest of the sick patients in the ICU and you've probably seen a little less of that over the last two months. But talk to us about the safety of coming to the hospital and should people come if, if they have symptoms of non-COVID uh, diseases? Yeah, that's a good question because I think initially there were a lot of people that were not coming to the hospital despite having very sig or having symptoms of very significant diseases like heart attacks or strokes. And oftentimes that led to worse outcomes for those people because they were so afraid to come to the hospital. Um, and so I think, you know, it, it with the, with with our use of PPE, as we've described here, it is very safe to come to the hospital and it is very important to come to the hospital when you have these alarming symptoms so that we can address, you know, diagnose and address a disease that we can help and improve upon so that you can survive and have a very good outcome. So very important to come. Thanks. And then Dr. Permeggia, maybe you could comment a little bit. Again, the same sort of questions I think are out there about coming to an outpatient visit? Should I go see my primary care doctor? Should I go see my cardiologist? Is it safe? And maybe can you talk a little bit about some of the things that we put in place in our own physician group to, to keep patients safe? Yes. So, you know, piggybacking on what Dr. Lewis had mentioned, um, people still present with very severe disease, and this disease often uh, manifests with more subtle symptoms early. Um, and not everything can be managed in a telephone call or even a virtual visit. Uh, there's importance to a physical examination. Some of those clues can be picked up early and the patients can get the appropriate lab testing and imaging that they need. In the office, um, we have protocols in place to keep us all safe. Much like in the hospital, we are using personal protective equipment and we ask that patients remain masked as well. We will have temperature screening in addition when they come in. Um, so we can safely physically examine a patient and treat them in the outpatient setting. Thanks. So my final question, and then maybe I'll ask for some, some closing thoughts. That maybe Dr. Modak can, can answer this. Are we going to get back to normal? Or is this a new normal? Will we get back to a pre-COVID? What would it take to get back to pre-COVID? I don't think we're ever going to get back to a pre-COVID normal, but I don't think this is our new normal either. So if COVID was eliminated, if we had a vaccine that was 99% effective, yes, I think we could get back to something like what was there pre-COVID. But really, we're looking at a vaccine that maybe will give us 60 to 70% immunity. We'll get herd immunity. Most people won't get it. There may still be some. Um, 
I think there's lessons to be learned here because even if we handle COVID as a country, as a world globally, if we handle it well and we eliminate its threat, what is the next virus? I think that's the lesson that we've been talk we talk about with every outbreak, but it's now in all of our faces that even after this, what's going to happen in a few years? What's next? So we need to learn some lessons. We need to learn lessons, you know, what can we do here? Number one, we can wash our hands. I don't think we're going to be in a situation where we wear masks for the rest of our life, where we can't go outside, where we have to have appointments to get into a store. I think we will return to some kind of normalcy. But is it really necessary um, for a restaurant to put a table every foot and squeeze as many people in? Maybe we can separate a little. Maybe people will start taking out food more and bringing it home. You know, maybe we will limit gatherings. There's no need to have so many people in such close proximity because that's how infections spread. And there's certainly th things that we know about now that that seems that the risks are just not necessary. So I think we will get to a point where we will be out in society, but we're going to be more aware of people who are sick around us. I think hopefully a good take home message for everyone is when you are not feeling well, stay at home because it does have consequences because you will spread your probably minor virus, but you don't know what it is. And we don't want things to spread in our community. You know, one of, one of the things I thought was very interesting during this whole uh, pandemic was once everybody sort of went to stay at home in, in March, flu activity essentially went to zero, um, which is not to suggest everybody should stay at home every year for the flu. But, you know, if you follow social distancing, if you're washing your hands, you're being aggressive about that. You can stop, stop some of these infectious uh, diseases. So why don't I go around and ask each of the, uh, my colleagues here for some closing thoughts, and I'll start with Dr. Lewis. Um, yeah, I, I think that what I want to say is it's such an honor to be working at Virginia Hospital Center and to be part of the solution, um, to be part of the pandemic planning team, and then to be, to be treating the, these patients, the patients in our community that are suffering from COVID. Um, and it's... It's been the teamwork, as I said, has been amazing, and then it's it's been so interesting also to to learn about COVID and to be treating people and helping them as we're learning. So, Dr. Promegia, sure. Um, I would say that I think we really just need to maintain our focus on the we before me. You know, we need to protect each other. As Dr. Modak said, we don't go out when we're sick. We wear masks when we need to. Um, and there will not be a new normal. There's no going back to normal. I think we need to learn um, lessons from this. Uh, what uh, We didn't touch on it too much, but in our community, we saw that nursing homes and the Hispanic community were disproportionately affected. And so we're learning what made those communities so vulnerable and what are we going to do to improve that for the next time. Thank you. Dr. Modak. I want to take this time to especially thank our administration of the hospital and particularly Dr. DeLisi. I think it's very hard to run a hospital. And during these last three months, I've never heard, you know, hey, that's cost too much. We shouldn't do that. I've made suggestions, all of us have. And the answer was, is that the right thing to do? Is that going to help our patients? Is that going to save lives? We are going to do it. And it's very refreshing. It's When I as Dr. DeLisi said, you know, we go home and we read the literature and we try to say, what can I bring to my hospital? And it's very refreshing to know that when I do that, that if there's something that makes sense medically, that's going to help our patients, we're going to implement it, that it's going to help our community. And I, I want to thank our administration. Thank you, Dr. DeLisi, for allowing us to do that. Well, thank you for those kind words, but it really thanks to all of you. Um, we're, I'm always so humbled and feel so fortunate to be at Virginia Hospital Center with the team, the staff, the hospital staff, the medical staff that I get to work with each and every day, they put the patient first. Um, you know, I think we really do put the, the needs of the patient first here at Virginia Hospital Center, and that's always our guiding principle. Uh, is this best for our patients? And if the answer is yes, we're going to do that. And I think that philosophy has really uh, been exemplified here in the last couple of months as we've been dealing with this COVID pandemic. But I also want to thank all of you that are uh, on this call today, on this uh, video conference today, uh, all of you that have been part of those uh, foundation leadership calls. Uh, it's so heartening for all of us to know the support that's out there for us in the community. We really appreciate that. It, it keeps us all going each and every day as well. So thank you for your support. Thank you for your time. 
We really appreciate it, and we are proud to serve you and the whole community.